Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you so much for the invitation to be a part of this really great conference. I'm excited to see so many presentations that explore and demonstrate significant developments and innovations in the field of heritage. So, like, I, I just need to clarify that I myself, I do not produce any of these kind of virtual environments, <laughs> but I explore them from the position of uh, critical position as spaces for cultural diplomacy. So feel free to ask any questions throughout my presentations by using uh, Q&A or chat, and I will be happy to answer all these questions once I finish, if I have some time. So my presentation today will discuss transformation of museums culture and digital diplomacy under the pressure of COVID-19 global outbreak and its implications. It will share some observations and explorations of the pandemic-related digital museum practices and trends, which I argue bring museums to a new turn in the heritage diplomacy, which I call mobile or intimate diplomacy. Before I move forward, let me start with some uh, very important definitions. So initially, cultural diplomacy was defined by the United United States Department uh, in 1959 is the direct and enduring contact between people of different nations to help create a better climate of international trust and understanding in which official relations can operate. So cultural diplomacy is better known, though, as the cross-cultural exchange of ideas, information, arts, and other aspects of culture among nations and their peoples to foster mutual understanding. It is still mainly understood as an activity initiated by the government or within the foreign policy agenda of a particular uh, state. So historically, museums have remained key actors of cultural diplomacy, as well as vital hosting spaces of official high-level diplomatic events. Museums traveling exhibitions, cross-cultural museum loans, and professional exchanges have always empowered rich and diverse museum collections to communicate political messages beyond national borders. A classic example of museum diplomacy would be a historic visit in 1963 of the famous Mona Lisa painting by Leonardo da Vinci to the United States. So the opening reception at the White House had a historically unprecedented turnout of more than 2,000 guests, including every member of the president's cabinet, all the senators and congressmen, not to mention the heads of key cultural institutions in the United States. So this painting arrived in the United States with bodyguards of 20 persons. Can you imagine that? So many, many people, millions of people actually attended the exhibition of Mona Lisa in New York and in Washington, D.C. in just 30 days. So uh, Mona Lisa in this uh, case did more than merely help to improve the frosty relationships between the United States and France. It also demonstrated to the whole world the major geopolitical shift of power from the old world to uh, the United States. However, in previous centuries, the implementation of cross-cultural exchanges in the world of museum was quite restricted. In a time when travel and communication technologies were quite limited, a cross-cultural contact between uh, and among museums and the international audiences was a top-down exercise that was commissioned by national governments. In the contemporary global media environment, these cross-cultural encounters are happening all the time in various online spaces. Online museums have become important media channels for projecting cultural and political discourses beyond national borders. At the same time, they promise to provide social spaces for cross-cultural dialogue, connecting people from different parts of the world. So my recently published book, Museum Diplomacy in the Digital Age, has documented the development of the digital museum diplomacy in the past two decades. It explored case studies of the global online campaigns developed by um, major museums in Australia, UK, and the United States. And these cases demonstrated that online museum spaces can serve as vital avenues for projecting a national interest and perspectives to the world. The book also questions questioned whether online museum spaces can really establish and sustain uh, cultural relations across borders. 
It revealed that digital museum diplomacy does require careful collaboration with existing online and offline communities, because by empowering audiences to build their own digital platforms and spaces, museums can create a more credible and comfortable online environment that goes beyond mere promotion or propaganda. The book was also instrumental to reveal that museums, uh, that museums replicated the historical development in the digital dimension, progressing museum diplomacy from a primitive propaganda activity to a more advanced public center two-way communication platform. And during the pandemic crisis, the diplomacy reached a new quality that offered audiences completely new, more intimate heritage experiences. Before the presentation unfolds the analysis, it is worthwhile though to step back to explain the background story of the historical development of the museum agency. So going back to the times of the Renaissance, one can trace the development of the first European museums that emerged from collections of strange objects arriving from the New World. And most of the collections in the 16th century were housed in the cabinets of curiosity. By the 18th century, the concept of the museum had been established and revealed the trend towards openness, sociability, and publicity, while remaining rooted in the tradition of order and display. With a strong colonial legacy, museums became important political actors on the world stage by exercising power of communicating new meanings of their ethnographic and cultural collections. Uh, interestingly, by the end of the 19th century, uh, the narratives of these collections developed strong links to the idea of the nation, with the concept of the museum as an instrument for the democratic education of the masses of the citizens, and at the beginning of the 20th century, museums served as national expressions of identity on the, uh, in the global environment. So more recently, the international agenda of contemporary museology has urged these institutions to become responsible social actors. Since the inception of the new museology movement, the development of the public uh, educational programs has become just as important as the more traditional task of cultural preservation. So this revolution shifted the uh, main emphasis to the cultural and social context within which the meaning of the objects in the museum is generated. And more importantly, it promised to transform a museum from a temple into a forum to provide a mediative space where cultures could meet and debate. So in my book, I explored three cases of museum diplomacy, which exemplified a specific stage of the museum development, starting with the case of the digital repatriation diplomacy of the Virtual Museum of the Pacific, developed by the Australian Museum in Sydney. As the oldest museum in Australia with the largest ethnographic collection of the Pacific cultures in the world, the Australian Museum set the context of exploring digital version of early cabinets of curiosity. The Virtual Museum of the Pacific aspired to create digital storytelling bridges that connected indigenous communities uh, from the Pacific Islands with the cultural heritage in a digital world. So my analysis illustrated though that the virtual museum could not escape the perception that these specific cultural artifacts were being presented as objects of curiosity, selected, digitized, and displayed in keeping with the traditional canons of Western museology. The online collection of the Pacific objects did not necessarily speak to targeted source communities. So a history of the world in 100 objects developed by one of the largest museums in the world, the British Museum, in collaboration with BBC Radio 4, offered another case of museum diplomacy that was set up in the digital space as a public spectacle. Uh, known for its extremely rich and diverse collection across time and civilizations, the British Museum has always positioned itself as a cultural ambassador that is actively involved with contemporary cultural and geopolitical issues. With the rise of digital technologies and growing power of global media reach, the British Museum reinforced its ambition to represent the world under one roof. Uh, while a history of the world portal offered exciting opportunities for the public to participate in the creation of world history by sharing personal stories and objects, it was designed in the best traditions of the 18th century museum as a public spectacle. In fact, it presented a strategically designed and moderated communication space that projected the power and historical legacy of the British Empire. So finally, the book culminated with the case of the digital museum diplomacy that was built on the ideas of the museum as a social forum, 
Uh, YouTube Play Global Contest of Creative Videos, which was collaboration between Guggenheim Museum in New York and Google. Uh, so the Guggenheim, uh, a museum of contemporary and modern art, is better known, of course, uh, as a global franchise network that includes branches of Venice, Bilbao, and uh, Abu Dhabi. So as the sole owner and actual coordinator of the National Yes Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, the Guggenheim is a powerful actor on the world stage pursuing its ambition to completely redefine what international means in the 21st century. So continuing its series of collaboration with global corporations, such as Hugo Boss or BMW, YouTube Play was uh, co-developed with Google to celebrate the five-year anniversary of YouTube. And it brought a popular user-generated video culture to the museum space and effectively engaged thousands of participants and millions of followers from 91 countries. So the project masterfully exploited the public hype to create a virtual space for global brand promotion that extended the online power of American corporate diplomacy. However, all these cases of museum diplomacy happened before the pandemic. In my research, I observed that under the pressure of the pandemic, museum diplomacy reached a new level, which could be called internet or mobile diplomacy. While the museum agency has long been conceptualized as an imagery space or museum without walls, especially in light of the post-museology theory, a distributed nature of the museum really amplified even further when they were uh, pushed by the pandemic to operate as hybrid institutions existing between physical and virtual worlds. For instance, in 2020, Museum launched a new mobile application, Museum from Home, that allowed audiences to experience artworks from the comfort of their homes. Users are able to virtually place paintings and other objects on their walls and interact with them outside the museum. Cusium also collaborated with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology to conduct research on the perceptions of art through augmented and virtual reality. So in May 2020, they issued a report with findings that innovate challenging assumptions about how people experience art, particularly discussed by Walter Benjamins in his famous essay, The Walk of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. So while Benjamin argued that reproduced copies lose their authenticity and aura, the report by contrast suggested that the human brain doesn't really differentiate between digitally reproduced artworks and the originals. And this offers an exciting opportunity for museum diplomacy that now can reach people on their mobile phones, creating more targeted, personalized and intimate experiences. For example, one of such mobile experiences reinforcing the distributed nature of contemporary museum that exists at the age of its physicality and virtuality is live streaming. For instance, in the midst of the pandemic crisis, dozens of museums in China, including the National Museum of China, the Danhao Academy, and the Nanjing Museum, live streamed their programming on TikTok and Show, the most popular online platforms with hundreds of millions of monthly active users. And they were uh, able to reach in just one 10 million uh, audiences uh, around the world. So the live streaming format that received such a high popularity, especially among Chinese audiences, offered a new channel for bilateral museum diplomacy exercised by Western museums. A good example of this strategy is a highly successful live, live streaming tour of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London to Chinese audiences that took place in August 2020. The VA provided a virtual gallery travel for quite shows users broadcasted in Chinese language through a two hour long live streaming event. And it attracted almost 4 million people and generated more than 200,000 likes. 4 million people, uh, just to give you a context, is more than the annual uh, visitation of the actual museum before the pandemic. And this happened in just two hours. Viewers of the VA Kwai Show Tour were guided by the museum Chinese social media consultant and the curator of the Asian department. And the tour included the walk through several galleries, inviting audiences for an exciting exploration of the museum diverse collections. So social media museums have been used for at least a decade uh, right now. And even though museums experimented with it to develop more interactive and participatory experiences, in most cases, 
because social media is still used as a global PR tool to broadcast information about museums, offerings, exhibitions, events, and collections. However, during the current times when you, um, many people found themselves under lockdown, many craved for creative experiences, and in this sense, museums collections provided a unique source of heritage imagery to inspire creativity and to have offer meaningful activities. For example, in spring 2020, the museum campaign that has truly gone viral was one inspired by a Dutch Instagram user who started recreating works of fine art and posting photos on social media. And this stay-at-home art challenge was quickly picked up by the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam, the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, who encouraged their followers to participate and promote hashtags campaign on Twitter. In a few months, thousands of images from different corners of the world have been contributed to the Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook platforms of museums, including uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the Louvre in Paris, the Heritage Museum in St. Petersburg, National Gallery in London, and the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. Half a million of Russian users started their own Facebook groups sharing photo imitations of famous paintings from different museums around the world, encouraging amateur talent and supporting individual vision of cultural heritage is clearly a promising initiative for museums in wielding their soft power in the digital realm when physical museum visits are not possible or not economically viable. These are only a few cases of new channels and global trends trialed by museums in the midst of the pandemic crisis. The list of these innovative technologies, in fact, is quite long. It includes telepresence robots, accommodating virtual exploration of museums on site spaces, VR experiences of exhibitions, museum tours and collections, employment of artificial intelligence and bots who now guide audiences, personalized tours on their mobiles, chat with them on Telegram, or send them images from the museum collections on their demand, not to mention museum mobile games, of course. So doubt at least that all these new capabilities of digital technologies and online platforms have tremendously expanded the global reach of museums and scope of their activities. However, it is questionable whether these digital tools can improve or at least maintain the same level of cross-cultural relationships, which are based on human-to-human -human communication. Specifically, a lack of physical contact between participants prevent the development of deeper personal connections, which is important and critical for cultural diplomacy. However, we now have museums completely built in the metaverse, which brings this mobile and heritage diplomacy to a completely new level because it adds human to human interaction. Metaverse is different from mere VR tour uh, or a single player game. It is a whole world created for social interactions where people from different countries can meet in the right time and share their experiences together. For example, in the last year, many museums in Korea experimented extensively uh, in the metaverse. Last month, uh, Podo Museum on Jesu Island opened a server on metaverse platform Zepeta. And this space was used to present its new exhibition title, The World We Made, that features artworks of seven contemporary artists. Over 80,000 uh, people visited the museum in the metaverse in just one month. And there were a lot of, uh, you know, sharing of these experiences by taking selfie within the metaverse and bringing it to social media in the uh, real <laughs> physical reality, uh, which is uh, very exciting. So such museum visits create completely new uh, and more customized, intimate, yet at the same time, very social experiences, bringing museum goers for a productive exchange and an enjoyable shared time together. So most recently published book, Mobile Museums, argues that museums experience a paradigm shift in understanding of the agency and the heritage collections. A distinguished group of contributors to this uh, edited collection revealed that um, museum heritage collections are not dead assemblages. In a highly saturated global media space, museum collections do not only acquire a new level of digital mobility, they also offer meaningful content and context for human-to-human -human connection and highly social experiences that can be shared among participants from different countries beyond the physical reality. 
These claims, of course, have to be researched even further through a focused analysis of the impact of social interaction in museum metaverse. And this is one of the exciting tasks and opportunities that I will be pursuing in the uh, near future. And uh, this presentation, however, was helpful to clearly identify and differentiate among different stages of museum diplomacy, which progressed from digital projection diplomacy to a highly mobile and more customized and intimate diplomacy in the 21st century. So I probably need to stop here and I'm happy to answer your questions if you have any. And please feel free to connect beyond this online space to continue your discussion if there is an interest. Thank you. Perfect timing, Natalia. It was My timer has just gone up. So thank you very much for keeping to time. Um, do people have any questions um, specifically in the chat or QA? Um, I'll, one of the things that um, is probably a personal problem rather than an issue around your <laughs> particular really good paper is the issue of numbers and particularly from an Australian Pacific context where you have an entire culture preserved and protected by 200 people. The idea of the 3 million from a museum point of view of being a register of interest and diplomacy particularly, doesn't really let us see an equivalence between a nation that might be built from 200 people and their cultural knowledge and that of a billion people in say India or China. And inevitably we as museums are pushed towards the numbers game. And I wondered if you could talk a little about how that kind of small scale diplomacy can be enhanced through these kinds of ideas. Yeah, you're, you're quite right. So the global media environments works better for those museums <laughs> that are you know, located in megapolises, right? And they have a very strong colonial legacy. They have a multi-million storage of collections coming to them from different parts and civilizations around the world. So, and with major support from the government or other corporate sponsors, they acquire a lot of, uh, you know, digital power that allows them to translate their heritage into the digital soft power where they can reach more people, where they can be targeting uh, particular audiences of particular countries or of particular language background. So yes, uh, in some cases it's, it's a number again, but what is going on actually in smaller communities and smaller museums, smaller nations where there is not so much resources and how this could be translated into the digital soft power. So, but I would say the quantity not is not necessarily um, uh, the meaningful in the context of cultural diplomacy, which is based on human to human interaction and actually understanding each other and sharing each other traditions and knowledge. So a new kind of consensus could be born in this interactive space of communication. So the quality of communication does matter. And uh, my kind of uh, understanding of what could be done uh, in the digital media environment right now uh, provides um, a lot of opportunities how you can communicate, uh, you know, in the digital space. It's, it's about how you uh, actually leverage uh, your uh, content and your storytelling power and potential to tell about yourself in this highly competitive, uh, uh, very saturated media environment. Yes, it's challenging, but of course, uh, everything is also connected to the um, financial resources that these small communities can get access to in order to increase their the digital mobility of their heritage collections. Uh, but I would say, I would still say it's more about quality rather than quantity in the end of the day. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I, I answered it, but I just tried. No, no, it was so. interesting. Unfortunately, we've eaten up the time for other questions. There are two Q questions in the Q&A. If you could type answers to them, that would be wonderful. Okay. Um, but for the moment, we'll move on to um, the paper by Ibra Ibrahim Itani, Kaja and Ben Hora. Oh, I think we're at a break time now, actually. Are we? Oh, are we in a break? 
Let me just double check. <laughs> Yes, it's break time from 10.50 to 5 past 11. Yes. That's, that's why I'm having a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so that gives Natalia some time to type her answers um, or to prefer to speak. And we'll see you back here at 11. Okay, then I will just, you know, it's better for me to talk. So, yeah, people can leave for a break. And those who ask me questions, I am happy to answer right now. So the first question from Tamikar, uh, it's about uh, the viral hashtag phenomenon. She says it's very compelling and encouraging, but how can museums organically and authentically recreate such a ground up movement and viral marketing professionals or just a playful approach? So, so the book that uh, I featured today, The Digital Diplomacy, The Digital Aid, one of the most important finding of my book is that the more power the museum gives to its communities, the better diplomatic implications are. The better people pick up the ideas and uh, the ideas go viral around the world. So museums need sometimes to uh, give up uh, um, their authority in, you know, in building the spaces, in providing opportunities, in, uh, you know, pushing audience for particular platforms or curating their content for example, crowdsourcing campaigns have been, uh, you know, with museums for around a decade right now, right? So it's, at, at some point, it's very democratic, right? It's, it's to provide audiences an opportunity to complete, contribute their own talent, their own creativity to the museum collections. However, if they are being curated, it become by museums and curated, and how they are being displayed in the end of the day, and in what particular spaces, and in comparison to what other content, it becomes a powerful tool to limit uh, the the power of these experiences for audiences. So for people to pick up the idea and let it go viral, it's very important for them to do it on their own. So that's why the trend right now uh, in museums is, is to uh, be a sense, sensitive to what's going on in the online communities, uh, knowing where your audiences are, uh, which platforms do they use, uh, and understanding what is important for them at the moment. And uh, yeah, so and just supporting, supporting <laughs> their creative ideas. Um, otherwise, it's not possible. If you build specific platforms, like my book, you know, explored several cases, and in each particular case, it indicated like the more power you uh, keep as a museum to build the spaces, to invite audience, to curate the content, the less implication it has. So yeah, just be sensitive, be open, uh, be inviting, and don't be afraid of get messy. <laughs> so uh, I had uh, two guest speakers from the United States from my classes on uh, digital heritage last week. And one uh, and, uh, of them was from the uh, San Francisco a Museum of Modern Art, who, uh, you know, created this send me a bot campaign. So where they're uh, uh, people could ask uh, using the mobile phone to ask the museum to send them uh, a particular, not a particular painting, but to send a painting from their collection, from their executive collections, by using any emoji or any, uh, uh, you know, keyword or any kind of, uh, uh, for example, send me coffee and uh, their museum will send them uh, their pictures in their collection, which contains some references to the coffee, for example. So it went viral in just one month. Again, the message from him was he didn't, he was not afraid to get messy. <laughs> he just, you know, he came up with the idea, he implemented the idea very quickly, and he was not afraid that something will happen. And actually, it was such a great success. So another question, I hope I answered it somehow. So Another question from another attendee. Do you see metaverse museums becoming more common beyond the pandemic? Um, I, I would say it's going quite slow. It also depends on their specific uh, 
country and contents and their economic potential of people to buy headsets, you know, to engage uh, in this uh, online environments, uh, virtual env environments. But definitely, this is the trend to explore for the future. Uh, yes, uh, I think in the future, many, many more museums will be going into metaverse because it's more social, it's more interactive, it provides completely new quality of experiences beyond just common, uh, you know, single user via VR tool, for example. So, yes, it's, it's, it's going that direction, but not necessarily very fast. Uh, but yes, the, uh, the pandemic accelerated this trend. Yes. Thank you very much for all your questions. Thank you so much for the energy that you gave me this morning and uh, have a nice conference, everybody.